Um, so I will be uh, moving on to Jonglei uh, State um, uh, in South Sudan. So uh, just for those who are a little bit less familiar with, with, with that context. Um, in South Sudan, of course, uh, a lot of the humanitarian response is still linked to significant population movements. Uh, that's returnees uh, from Sudan into South Sudan, refugees from Sudan into South Sudan, and from South Sudan out into Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya, but also internal displacement. And in particular, in relation to internal displacement, uh, at the moment, one of the largest humanitarian responses in South Sudan is uh, the situation in Jonglei State, and in particular, the conflict that's largely playing out in, in Pibor County, to some extent also Pochala County. Um, so Jonglei State being the, the largest on the map. Uh, in, in Pibor County itself, this is a snapshot uh, that shows at the moment uh, how the humanitarian response is going and, and who is being reached where. Uh, just to, to give you a bit of a sense of the kind of the nature of the violence that we see, uh, the red dots on the map show uh, incidents of intercommunal violence. So I suppose the first thing to say in, in relation to Jonglei is that they're there has, for a long time, communities have been threatened by intercommunal, to some extent also intracommunal, but uh, intercommunal violence between different counties or, or ethnic groups, uh, often, uh, in particular, when they become retaliatory attacks targeted at civilians, but very frequently or most often uh, with an economic objective of, of cattle raiding. Uh, in Pibor County, over the course of the last year or so, uh, that has become overlaid with uh, another dynamic of, of violence and uh, hostilities taking place between the SPLA, the state security forces, and non-state armed actors. Uh, I say non-state armed actors because whilst uh, there is in particular one group, the, the SSDA, that's a more formalized armed group, uh, non-state armed actors may also be less formal groups, and in particular because there is this intercommunal violence, uh, and there are large numbers of armed youth across the entire state um, who may also be pursuing other objectives like cattle raiding. There isn't always necessarily a clear political objective, or groups may merge depending on uh, what happens to be convenient or what objectives are being pursu pursued at that time. Um, the other thing to say about Zhongli State is that uh, it's uh, an extremely challenging physical environment at this particular time of the year. We're in the middle of the rainy season, um, and uh, for at least six months of the year, in some cases nine months of the year or so, this entire county is inaccessible. You can't move anywhere by road. You can only get around on foot, or you have to go by helicopter. There's a limited movement along, along the rivers by boat. Um, but of course, if you put insecurity over all of this, the options begin to shrink. Um, so in terms of the, the impact on civilians, um, of course, at the moment, uh, that means that everybody's at risk of displacement. Uh, the vast majority of Pibor County, uh, which has a population of about 150,000, at this point has been displaced multiple times. Um, a lot of people are back in their homes at the moment. Uh, because there's been a bit of a lull in the fighting during the rains, um, but have seen three, four, five, or multiple cycles of displacement over the last year and a half or so. <coughs> um, and uh, the serious constraints in humanitarian access um, are also very much from the perspective of the beneficiary, a lack of ability to move freely and to move into some of the areas where traditionally people would seek services and assistance um, because the conflict has disrupted uh, the, the normal activities in towns. Um, I'll get to that in more detail in a minute. So in terms of the limitations that we had on humanitarian actors, when we look back to, uh, to last August when the, the conflict re-emerged in Pibor County in particular, we had quite a small number of actors, and we also had actually quite small actors. So the, the agencies uh, that were present there, and I believe it was only NGOs really with a permanent presence, no UN agencies, um, did not necessarily have an emergency response background, didn't necessarily have the institutional capacities uh, necessary to, to analyze the conflicts, uh, to conflict dynamics, to analyze security, to engage in advocacy or access negotiations. So when we saw the conflict break out again last, last August, uh, uh, they were at a bit of a loss as to how do we respond to that. Um, we also had, uh, from the start, very much a reluctance on the part of authorities both civilian and military authorities to facilitate humanitarian access. 
Um, so both humanitarian actors that were a bit afraid to move from their regular modus operandi, which was focused very much on towns, in particular around six towns or so in Pibor County, where there was some limited presence of services, about three of those where there were a significant number of, of NGOs, um, and to, to go beyond, look into the rural areas, uh, and also a reluctance on the part of the state to allow that to, to happen. Um, I'm putting up this map, actually. I, I, I really dislike this map, and I, I was very frustrated that we had to use it for months because it showed a bit the period to which we'd gotten um, only around six, six or seven months ago. So in, uh, in the beginning of the year, because of the impact of the conflict, civilians fled all the towns. So we had all these red boxes that showed the towns that had emptied. Uh, and there were virtually no civilians remaining in any of the towns. Uh, the army had moved in. Uh, the army launched a military offensive in March uh, to, uh, in an effort to address the threat posed by, uh, by the non-state armed group, by the SSDA. And uh, the civilians who felt that they were at risk of being targeted uh, by the army, um, in particular following uh, a, a civilian disarmament campaign led by the army in the previous year, and high numbers of incidents uh, where civilians felt there was a, a lack of distinction between who's a combatant and, and, and who's not a combatant, uh, had moved into the rural areas and we virtually had no access uh, from a humanitarian perspective. So we're dealing with about 150,000 displaced people, no access, and actually very little idea. And again, the map shows that quite well. You see these blobs that are shaded? That was at the time our idea of where concentrations of populations were, but really we had very little idea. We didn't really know where people had gone. Um, we didn't really understand what their needs were, and we were not very well equipped as a humanitarian community to, to try to address their needs. Um, so in terms of negotiating access, I'll just briefly touch on what we did and then try to draw a bit on how that's going now. All of this is, of course, still very recent, and we're still grappling a bit with it. Um, but uh, then initially, there was... Uh, a discussion within the humanitarian community. Since last August, there hadn't been uh, any individual agencies that had managed to get out, either because of their own institutional constraints, and in the case of, of one or two kind of more experienced independent humanitarian actors that had sought to pursue access negotiations, um, a blocking in particular by authorities uh, at the idea of going into the rural areas where there was no state present and where the non-state armed actors were, were influencing the security context. Um, so uh, at the point in particular when we produced this map, we had no response. Um, we were focused entirely on uh, negotiating access and getting acceptance for the idea of a humanitarian response for these communities with the authorities, and in particular uh, with the SPLA. Um, that took place over the course of several months and was also at the request of the humanitarian country team uh, led to some extent uh, by OCHA at the working level that involved us engaging in Pibor County with the military uh, at the divisional level, so in Zhongli State, in, in Bor Pampandia, uh, with the 8th Division, and then of course at SPLA headquarters, and, and there is of course also where the higher level advocacy came in, uh, working with the HC, uh, with the embassies, and in particular um, also with the humanitarian wing of the government, the Relief and Rehabilitation Commission who acted as a very strong ally uh, to the humanitarian community, explaining again and again to different parts of the government and then also to the military why humanitarians were asking for this and why some of the concerns that had arisen um, would uh, we would be in a position to handle. In terms of the concerns and where the reluctance stemmed from, I think it's fairly similar to what we see in other contexts. The two main concerns really were about are they are people really interested in going to these places for humanitarian reasons? Once humanitarian actors go, will that spark off anything else? Will there be political engagement? Will this give legitimacy or credibility to political agendas? Or will there be human rights investigations or things carried out that are not directly linked to life-saving emergency needs? Uh, the second big concern, of course, was uh, what about the assistance and where will it go? will there be diversion of assistance? And these were the two things that we repeatedly kept getting feedback on by the authorities and that we had to invest quite a lot into trying to address and explain in detail what mechanisms we would put in place to try to at least manage those concerns. Um, by July of this year, thankfully, we, we had quite a breakthrough, um, in particular, as I said, through the, the result of the advocacy, not just from us, but also by the RRC, and I'd say a couple of embassies in particular where the SPLA chief of staff um, 
committed himself in writing to allowing humanitarian actors to go into these areas, and we were able to follow up kind of down the command chain to engage with all of the different parts to get the relevant safety assurances. Whilst all of this was happening, turning a bit more to the negotiations with the non-state armed side, again, uh, because the actors on the ground didn't have those contacts uh, and uh, in, to a large extent didn't feel comfortable pursuing this, uh, OCHA was asked by the humanitarian country team to play a more active role. Um, so they're really focused on um, establishing contact initially and then building a relationship, negotiating the modalities under which a response could take place. The uh, initial uh, response from that side was to welcome the humanitarian actors and so what we've been focusing on largely and you'll see on the, the right-hand side is since the response had started, is to, to negotiate sort of operating rules and what principles to ensure that everybody in all of the different areas that we've since been able to go to understands what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Just to give an example, one of the agreements that we have is uh, that in the areas where humanitarian activities take place, uh, those, those are weapons-free zones, so we've plastered them with no-gun stickers, but from the start we had quite strong buy-in from, uh, from the non-state armed group that even in areas where we know there is high presence of non-state armed actors, um, that that's kept outside, that we've so chosen spots that really are demilitarized, where we don't see lots of weapons and uniforms, and we don't have a high presence of people who could potentially interfere with or divert assistance. Um, the final thing I'll mention, even though it probably doesn't immediately pop to people's minds when we talk about humanitarian negotiations, was actually keeping in mind that this was done through a, a the framework of the humanitarian country team, and that OCHA was leading the negotiations, and we were using UNHAS assets to do this, was actually it had to take place within the framework of the UN security management system. Uh, and believe it or not, that has taken probably as much time as all of the negotiations put together to ensure that that's able to, ha to happen and to negotiate with the relevant parts of the system um, to, to, to implement what we had envisioned doing. So I'll just reflect very briefly on a couple of challenges and uh, successes um, uh, in terms of challenges. Um, uh, this, as I said, the response has only been going on for about three months now. Until now, we've registered and assisted about 85,000 people, so we still have some way to go. Um, it is still a very unpredictable security environment. It's, it is challenging as a context to work in. Um, we are still struggling with some of these issues related to integrated missions, um, including the security of the UN being double-hatted, but also other sections um, wanting to kind of move in. This is, these are areas that UNMIS in the past have not had access to, and now, of course, there being a much higher interest that humanitarian actors are going to see what other non-humanitarian actors could do in these areas and how that will impact on us. Um, the operation costs a lot of money. Uh, at the moment, for the humanitarian community, we have seven UNHAS helicopters. This is the only way we can get to these areas. We need more, so if we want to reach more people, it costs more money. Um, and we are starting to see a bit that OCHA is taking on, quite frankly, a, a very strong role in negotiating that may not be appropriate as we move into some of the more operational parts of the response and we try to engage with partners to see how they can take that responsibility over again. Um, some of the factors that could potentially be replicated and that we'll hope to build on um, is definitely the, the high-level advocacy, so having the support of actors that have the trust and engagement um, of those who, who were initially reluctant, and particularly the role of the RSC has been very helpful, um, but also uh, the, the donor support and the embassies, um, both in terms of pushing and in terms of being willing to fund a response that is as expensive as this for what is actually, I guess compared to some other contexts, a, a fairly small uh, number of beneficiaries. So I'll leave it at that. I'm happy Thank to you very much. Thank you. Thank you.